Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of the History Guy podcast is brought to you by Magellan TV, a new kind of streaming service aiming to bring you the best documentaries from around the world. On today's episode, the History Guy talks about a pair of weird wars. First, the time that Mao's China went to war against sparrows, and then a war between Mexico and France that began over pastries. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. There have been some very odd wars fought in human history for odd reasons, and one of the strangest of those wars demonstrates the fact that sometimes things done with the best of intentions can have horrible results. That time when China went to war with sparrows deserves to be remembered. In 1958, the newspaper the Peking People's Daily proclaimed a declaration of war from the nation's leader, Mao Zedong. No warrior shall be withdrawn until the battle is won. All must join battle ardently and courageously. We must persevere with the doggedness of revolutionaries. This was not a small conflict that was being declared, not a border engagement. This enemy required the attention of all of China's estimated 630 million population. This was a battle to the death that required not just the military, but one in which even school children would be expected to take up arms. Every citizen would be expected to kill the enemy, and those kills would be counted to ensure that each and every warrior was doing his patriotic duty. In China, in 1958, to lag behind in a conflict declared by the government could mean severe punishment. China moved as one, and dissent was not allowed. Across the nation, the radio played an anthem, Arise, arise, O millions with one heart, braving the enemy's fire, march on. So what was this mortal enemy that had to be pursued with such dogged determination? Passer Montanus, better known as the Eurasian Tree Sparrow. The sparrow, distinguished by a chestnut-colored crown and nape, a black bib, and one black patch on an otherwise pure white cheek, is widespread throughout temperate areas of Eurasia and Southeast Asia. Tree sparrows are about 12 and a half to 14 centimeters, or 5 and a half inches long. Through much of Europe, a similar species, Passer domesticus, otherwise known as the house sparrow, is more associated with human habitation, whereas the tree sparrows tend to live in the woods. House sparrows are larger than tree sparrows and more aggressive, tending to drive tree sparrows out of nesting places. But in Asia, the tree sparrow lives commonly in towns and cities. Tree sparrows eat grains and seeds, but also eat invertebrates, insects, spiders, centipedes, and millipedes. So why would China go to war with sparrows? An estimated 14 million people died in China during the Second World War. China was in fact at war with Japan before the German invasion of Poland, which is usually considered the start of the Second World War. During part of that war, China was really fighting two wars, as the Chinese Civil War was being fought between 1927 and 1937, at the same time that China was fighting Japan. Although the Nationalists and the Red Army made common cause against Japan between 1937 and 1945, clashes between their forces continued. The conflict exploded into open warfare again in 1946, killing an estimated 6 million more. When Chairman Mao declared the creation of the People's Republic of China in 1949, the country had been at constant warfare for 22 years, and there were years more of insurgencies. Development had stagnated and the population was largely poor. Public health was in a dismal state, with infant mortality as high as 300 per thousand live births. Disease was rampant with tuberculosis, plague, cholera, polio, malaria, smallpox, and hookworm endemic throughout much of the country, and recurring cholera epidemics that, in some years, killed tens of thousands. Thus, when in 1958, Chairman Mao and the Communist Party of China initiated a plan called the Great Leap Forward, intended to rapidly transform China from an agrarian society to an industrial society, a great patriotic health campaign was included among the many reforms of the period. The campaign was called the Four Pests Campaign and targeted rats, flies, mosquitoes, and sparrows. The program amounted to a carte blanche issued to the people to fulfill their duty to the nation through the massacre of the small bothersome animals and insects. So why were sparrows on the list with rats and mosquitoes? 
Chinese scientists had calculated that each sparrow consumed four and a half kilograms of grain each year, and that for every million sparrows killed, there would be food for 60,000 people. Part of the goal of the Great Leap Forward was to increase agricultural production via the use of communal farms. The sparrows were seen as a threat to production at a time when the government was promising a multifold increase in food production. An environmentalist may be concerned with such a radical attack on the ecosystem, but Mao was convinced. Journalist Dai King argues that Mao knew nothing about animals. He didn't want to discuss his plan or listen to experts. He just decided that the four pests should be killed. During the era, scientists who challenged the government were often denounced or repressed, and the result was that a revolution based on science was often driven by bad science. One historian described the philosophy of science during the period as one of better read than expert, as political ideology was valued above scientific principles. The traditional Chinese religions of Confucianism and Taoism tended to stress living in harmony with nature. Sparrows were a common theme in traditional Chinese art, but Mao saw nature as being subservient to man. In May 1958, he said in a speech to the party congress, Make the high mountain bow its head, make the river yield its way. Mao used a common phrase, Ren Ding Shen Qin, meaning man must conquer nature, as the motto of the program. For example, Mao was a great supporter of the ideas of a Russian biologist named Trofin Lysenko. Lysenko theorized that under the proper conditions, nature can provide virtually limitless resources. The philosophy was particularly appealing to a nation looking to create super productive agricultural communes. The problem was that Lysenko was almost completely wrong about science, something that could happen more readily in a nation where scientific dissent was repressed in the name of ideology. Among his dangerously flawed biological ideas, Lysenko theorized that seeds should be planted very close together under the idea that a species would never cannibalize itself. In that he was simply wrong. Seeds planted so close together do compete resulting in stunted plants and reduced yield. China was able to apply a huge amount of effort and unity of purpose. Built over the course of a decade, the Red Flag Canal runs along a mountain cliff and through 44 tunnels across the Taihang Mountains, diverting water from the Zhang River to valleys in northern Henan province. Astoundingly, the 71 kilometer or 44 mile canal was built using hand tools, and yet the construction of the canal saw more earth moved in a single week in 1959 than the total move to create the entire Panama Canal. The same type of effort was put into the war against sparrows. Mao directed, here is the method. We make our resolution. We coordinate our actions. We divide our tasks. We cut off the food supply. We set up a trap and we continue our battle of destruction. The public health campaign was implemented by everyone, from troops of children to the elderly. The population took to banging pots and pans or beating drums to scare the birds from landing, forcing them to fly until they fell from the sky in exhaustion. Sparrow nests were torn down, eggs were broken, and nestlings were killed. Sparrows and other birds were shot from the sky. One witness from the time explained, It was fun to wipe out the four pests. The whole school went to kill sparrows. We made ladders to knock down their nests and beat gongs in the evenings when they were coming home to roost. The campaign was made into an ideological battle, with the government declaring that birds are public animals of capitalism. Contests were held among enterprises, government agencies, and schools over those who handed in the largest number of dead sparrows. A Polish diplomat from the time recalled that when the Polish embassy in Beijing denied the Chinese request to enter the embassy premises to scare away the sparrows there, the Chinese merely surrounded the embassy with people beating drums. After two days of constant drumming, the Poles had to use shovels to clear the embassy of dead sparrows. A newspaper in Shanghai gave a description of the campaign. The citywide battle to destroy the sparrows began. In large and small streets, red flags were waving. On the buildings and in the courtyards, open spaces, roads, and rural farm fields, there were numerous scarecrows, sentries, elementary and middle school students, government office employees, factory workers, farmers, and People's Liberation Army shouting their war cries. In the city, in the outskirts, almost half of the labor force was mobilized into the anti-sparrow army. Usually the young people were responsible for trapping, poisoning, and attacking the sparrows, while the old people and the children kept sentry watch. The factories in the city committed themselves into the war effort, even as they guaranteed that they would maintain production levels. In the parks, cemeteries, and hothouses, where there were fewer people around, 150 free fire zones were set up for shooting the sparrows. The Nanyang Girls Middle School Rifle Team received training in the techniques for shooting birds. Thus, the citizens fought a total war against the sparrows. By 8 p.m. tonight, it is estimated that a total of 194,432 sparrows have been killed.
China has never reported exactly how many sparrows were killed in the campaign, but the estimates are that, that at least many millions were killed, and that the species nearly disappeared in China before, in 1960, the flaw in the idea became apparent. Researchers at China's Academy of Sciences performed autopsy on several of the dead sparrows and determined that the birds ate large numbers of insects, largely agricultural pests. Simply put, the bugs the sparrows ate would have done far more damage to crops than the sparrows. Killing sparrows was, in fact, causing a greater loss in crops. Locust populations soared, devastating harvests. In 1960, the party replaced sparrows with bed bugs in the Four Pests campaign. It is amazing, given its almost unimaginable scope, how little the rest of the world knows about what in China is referred to as the three years of Great Chinese Famine between 1959 and 1961. Chinese government figures say that some 15 million people died of starvation and related diseases during these three years. And if that's true, that means that more people died in China due to the famine than died in China due to the Second World War. But most estimates assume that those government figures are far from reality. Independent estimates assume that between 30 and 45 million people actually died in the Great Chinese Famine. One of the worst famines in world history. And of course, the famine wasn't just caused by the Sparrow Campaign. There were numerous policy failures. For example, Lysenko's close planting theory simply didn't work and ended up causing many fields to be lost entirely to rot. Government officials were afraid that they would be punished if they didn't meet their production quotas, and so they falsified their numbers, which caused an illusion of abundance that kept government from acting. Even as the people of China were starving, the government of China was selling grain on the world market in order to get money to pay debts and shifting fields from food to cash crops. This is, of course, not the only time in history that politics and economics came together to cause an environmental disaster to the detriment of the government's citizens. But the, the poorly conceived and yet incredibly effective campaign against sparrows in China, which then caused a plague of locusts, is a great example of policy failure on the grandest level. As went the sparrows, so went the people. Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff you only get to hear about on the podcast. Uh, to some extent, uh, this is a, a war that could only have been declared and successfully carried out by a country like China under a government like Mao's. It really is incredible just how much loyalty or through fear or through actual loyalty, he was able to command. It's it's shocking, but impressive in that it's hard to imagine any other system where there could have been that many people willing to that fully embrace. Yeah, the that mobilize. I mean, honestly, in America, we've done some incredible things when the, oh, yeah. when the nation well moves. If there's a disaster and people are moving for relief and things like that, so I don't know that it it, it would have to be something where you have as much power as Mao. But when you really look at what they were doing, I mean, the idea that they even rolled the Boy Scouts out to you know chase the birds and all that sort of stuff, and all the elementary schools and all the, I mean, certainly you couldn't have done that uh, in any other place that I can think of. Even places with with pretty powerful dictators, uh, they don't usually have that much ability yeah. to move people so so it is it says something extraordinary about the how china was being run at the time but i mean also you know in almost any other place someone would raise their hand and say in this in this a bad idea yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's unique about China maybe at the time too, and you know possibly the Soviet Union at the time because some of the research came yeah. from there that that uh, people were just afraid to raise their hand and say you know the emperor has no clothes or rather let's not kill all the birds. Yeah. Well, that it was. I mean, that was a you'd call it I guess group think, but it, it's kind of an ex extreme example of it. But the part of group think where they're like people don't. I guess the idea of group think is that you generally don't want to do it because you don't want to upset the general balance. Whereas mm -hmm. this was more like. Uh, there was an official. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you don't want to go to prison or you know, disappear. It, but yeah. I mean, to be honest, uh, in, in North America, certainly we have hunted species to extinction, thinking that that would be better for farming or whatever. And, and it turned out to have environmental impacts that have caught us by surprise. Uh, and it's not that this couldn't happen elsewhere. It just couldn't really happen in the same way. I mean, I, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, I mean, it's not it's not all that powerfully different than, say, how we work to eradicate the plains buffalo. 
True. Um, just the, the motivation was done differently. Uh, and uh, but uh, so, I mean, I, I don't know that it would necessarily be unique to China, but especially in the era and especially the way that it occurred and the extent to which that, that it occurred. It's, it really does seem extraordinary. And it, it seems like something that would be very difficult to do in, in the vast majority of the ways the forms of government work to be able to move people in such unity of action. Yeah, because it's ultimately I mean, you're right. We've shot all the passenger pigeons to death. Like it's it's possible yeah, to kill huge wolves numbers. Or, of... I mean, we killed uh, we killed huge numbers of predators because we thought that would be better for game animals. And, and then we, you know, we will often find out that that's not necessarily a great idea. Uh, and so it's I, I mean, it just like I said it happens. It happens differently, but it's not like it, nowhere else could do that. And, and sometimes yeah. those are those are kind of government campaigns. Uh, not so far. It's it really is amazing. The the dedication to killing these things where mm -hmm. they're standing around the uh the embassy and clapping on things until the birds all die it's it's yeah. a truly incredible do you yeah the, the the effort to kill the sparrows inside the embassy i, I mean it's really is insane but yeah. i but uh there was i mean there was competition built into it and it was a demonstration of your loyalty and and you know you can see how you know, how that is an attractive ideology to say if we can figure out that bed bugs are the problem can we, you know, really move the entire population to get rid of bed bugs? Uh, but I mean, you also see then the risk that if you can do that, you can move into that form of action. That if you're making a mistake, uh, you know, it's it's hard to recover. From, there's no time to learn from that lesson because you know, boom, and and you're you have to deal. And as far as I know, they haven't gotten completely rid of bed bugs in China just by having the the the, the, the campaign going since the 50s. Those ones seem much harder to do than. Uh... Sparrows. Yeah, cockroaches, <laughs> cockroaches, and 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 bud bugs. Uh, you know, we've been trying that for a long time, and <laughs> we had less it's success. Hard to kill, uh, but it's. I mean, even those. There's a there's a question on. I mean, you know, they they're something relies on those as a food source, and so you know, if you kill enough. Yeah, anything. I mean, a kind of any time in history when we said we are going to eliminate some species because we don't like it, that uh, we've ended up having some side effects that you know make you wonder was that, whether that was a good choice. And you know, lots of other times when we've introduced species thinking it was a good idea and, and found out ah that was not a good idea. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I mean that's part of that is just the nature of humans versus nature. And and but I mean the the lessons that you learn along the way. I mean the because China can move to action so quickly, so fully, so forcefully, then it was a very hard lesson to learn. It wasn't something they had picked up over time. It was like all of a sudden, like oh, these were eating all the pests that were eating all the food. Maybe this was a really dumb idea, and uh, it's a little hard to fix now because we got you know a billion dead sparrows on the ground. Yeah. I, I can't remember if you if you mentioned it in the video. Has, has that? Do you know if that population of sparrows has recovered at all? Do talk about it at the end of the video, and it is slowly recovering. Uh, and uh, but I mean, it's you know when you've done that much damage to it over time. But uh, you know, sparrows are apparently not easy to eradicate. Yeah, they didn't even they didn't manage to quite do it. Um, still, probably could have with enough effort. But it's I mean, it's one of those it's one of those things that they came remarkably close, and it's it's absolutely tragic ultimately that it ends up turning out the way it does and I, that kind yeah, of brings... well, contributing to one of the worst famines in human yeah. history yeah it's i mean uh, that among other things uh and uh, that's you know it's terrifying to think that that you could uh, i mean certainly whatever you want to say about it the motivation of the sparrow campaign was you know because they thought it would improve public health uh, and uh, then you know to find out you know, that it would do the disaster cause the disaster that it does it's you know it's it's, it's a terrifying thought uh that we can move people to action in a way that turns out to be such a bad idea. It's a part of why, I mean, ultimately, it's a part of why some systems of bureaucracy exist where, you know, if we try to make decisions like that, you want to try to look at it from as many possible, you, you, you try to head that off to figure out like, okay, if we do do this, what, but that, that takes a lot of time and we're not necessarily going to be right even, but that's, that's part of the, that, that kind of snap decision of this seems to be a problem, let's destroy it. We've seen that turn out less than, less than ideally. Yeah, yeah, less than ideally. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not like everything's wrong, but uh, that's true. Yeah, you know, we run into. We've talked about that several times. I mean, sometimes it's flood control efforts that cause the flood. And, uh, so this is this is a really interesting and uh, egregious example, uh, and uh, and it, you know, it's history. It's history that deserves to be remembered. I mean, but also you know the way the same way that the population with you know with essentially hand tools just move water to change yeah. entire ecosystems and stuff like that. I mean, it's extraordinary. That you're able to do that, and and uh, it just you just wonder whoever's in charge, and you know, point in which direction to go. You hope they're pointing the right direction. Yeah, because that's that's just it. Is that we can do some incredible things, but sometimes those have some incredible consequences. It's it's also interesting, you know, the bad science behind some of these decisions. 
is a really good example of kind of how complex nature can be. And this was actually relatively simple uh, connections uh, other than some other ones that you've talked about on the channel. But I mean, when you really talk about it, how do you think that they, they missed that? In well, China? I mean, it's clearly at this point, uh, that was this ideological science. When, when scientists are afraid to check, to question a political leader, uh, then, you know, you, you can lead to, you know, bad science. So, I mean, I mean, theories don't always work out. But I mean, you know, literally they had this guy in the Soviet Union who was saying if you shove 50 seeds in one spot, that seeds from one species will never will never uh, 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 take from, from their own species. That's ridiculous. Of course they're going to, you know, yeah. scavenge for the same amount of resources. And so somehow he thought you can make and, – and it's there's actually videos from the time that are really bizarre to watch where, where they're having these – you know, the leaders of these different uh, communes are, are competing over how much wheat they're going to produce. And, you know, so, you know, whoever gets the biggest number, woo -hoo, everybody cheers. And then later on, when they're not getting there, because, you know, you killed the sparrows that ate the, that ate the uh, bugs, that ate the plants. And when it turns out that if you plant 50 seeds in one spot, all you get is a bunch of sick plants. Uh, and they're not meeting those numbers. Well, they're terrified because they promised that. And, you know, their life is on the line. And so they yeah. lie about it. And so famine becomes much more possible because the government's completely deluded about how much food they're producing. And, I mean, you can really see how this all comes together. But, I mean, the 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 way that uh, the British policy led to the Great Famine in Ireland or the the, the Bengal Famine, uh, yeah. I mean those are you know again it's it's it all works. Uh, I mean it might be different motivations and different reasons that you come to this, but I mean you can still lead to the same result. So it's not something that's necessarily unique to it. But I mean the the flawed science of the Sparrow campaign. Uh, to me, pretty obviously came from the fact that uh, scientists were in a position where they were saying what, what, what the government wanted to hear because, like everybody else, they were afraid to say anything else. Yeah. I mean, I think... It was I, not a culture where you could raise your hand and say, uh, here's the flaw in the plan. And and not to say that there, you know, we don't still have problems even, you know, in places where you're not afraid to raise your hand and where things are ignored or whatever. Uh, but it is it is... Ultimately, there was no room for another voice there, or you know, even a voice of caution. I think that it's it's a it's a good point about the the ideology. You know, I read a book um, by a Chinese author, a science fiction one, that talked about some of the some of the great leap forward. It was a fiction book, uh, but it's kind of reflected some of that because at the same time, they, there was this goal of you know gaining all of this technology and gaining all of this science and stuff that was part of the great leap forward but then you're you're really constrained by whether mm -hmm. your findings fall within the you know the the party um and that was i mean that was true even in you know to a it does, nazi yeah. germany where they everything was supposed to be and when you politicize some of the i mean some of the most basic kind of principles of the <laughs> even how you come up with it but it's difficult to make science conform to you know a particular yes. political ideology i mean it just but, it means but we've seen that happen in western cultures. we've seen oh, yeah. that happen in the oh, united absolutely. states too uh, and and so I, I certainly don't want to get anything current that we're talking about we don't go into current events but it is a cautionary tale that applies beyond China. Yeah. Uh, I also think, I mean, there is, there's something to the, to the Chinese ideology, the, the communist ideology, because it was a rejection of spiritualism. Yeah. Uh, and so previously, if you were to look at, say, Chinese art, there was a lot about living in peace with nature. And, and you know, this, the sparrows were actually a big part of Chinese art. And now we can suddenly declare them villains and that we're going to destroy them all. Part, when you, uh, uh, part of it was to, you could kill animals without any sort of guilt, without any sort of feeling of, of what that would mean, because, you know, you have placed the state first ahead of the, you know, those sorts of feelings. Yeah. Uh, and that's part of what could allow something specifically like, this. I mean, how do you, how do you get school kids to murder sparrows? And you to know, talk about you, it like it's fun. Yeah. And to brag, <laughs> push them carts full of them and, and stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's part of the, the, the ideology that was built. And part of the goal of that was to be able to, you know, really move the masses to do things. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that has done things and it has, you know, yeah. done bad things. I, I do. Uh, one of the, one of the phrases that you mentioned in there is, is that they called them uh, public animals of capitalism. Yeah. Which is, uh, I mean, first of all, I feel like I don't quite understand the, but it's it's almost not the point about whether you can actually like, you know, be like, ah, yes, the sparrow is a symbol of capitalism um, or is a capitalist, right? <laughs> As if, um, but that you can give them these political titles. I mean, that was, that was the point is that you can, you can do that yeah. and... Part, as part of a, you a whole them, system you know, of propaganda. You, you build your culture around, you know, we're going to attack enemies and we are all going to stand against these enemies for the good of everybody. And then yeah. you can tie your sparrows somehow to capitalists. I, I, I don't really get it either, how <laughs> a sparrow's capitalist. But, uh, but that, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny because they've already created enemies. And so you tie yeah. the sparrow to the enemy.
And these, I mean, this was this was a place, and it's happened many other times, many other cultures. This 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 level of politics was in every every piece of their life. Uh, you know, there was there was not really any any part of public or really even private life that didn't have some piece of this. And and I mean, to some extent, that's that's culture. And so it's going to be a part of every every piece of your life, and that this is just what that culture was looking like at the time. But it's it's. It is difficult, I think, for a lot of modern people, although there are plenty of modern people, too, who are living in regimes that mm -hmm. have this kind of stuff. But it's difficult for us to really think about how every decision you're making, every word you're writing, you know, you really have to consider whether it's going to fall under the these very, very specific, these guidebooks that are given yeah, out by the government. You yeah, know, that's, if you go uh, the wrong way, then, you're, you know, that could be the end. Of, you, we hear some stories of that coming out of China yeah. in the modern time, too. Yeah. But, uh, you know, again, you know, we get to the same point in Western yeah. cultures, too, sometimes. And in the United States, there's times when suddenly, you know, you can't say something. Maybe someone, something should have been said. And, uh, so, I mean, it's, uh, it's not, you yeah. know, it's just, it's just, it's, it's interesting how that particularly occurred. I don't think that the way that occurred could not have occurred so quickly, so drastically, uh, so easily in something, you know, you know yeah. like in the United States. But, uh, but it's hard to say. And it, it is, it's a cautionary tale in many ways, but one of them is, you know, it, it's a, it's a cautionary tale that what you believe, absolutely believe to be true to the point that you're committing your life to it is sometimes not a good idea. And it's, it's interesting you know, because the, the people that were banging the, banging the buckets and firing the shotguns, I'm sure were quite sure that they were serving their nation and feeding their neighbor. Uh, and, and with, you know, with, with absolute confidence, they're, you know, they're very proudly killing the sparrows. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that belief was so misdirected. It's, it's kind of shocking about what, you know, how, how much you can get people to believe in even a, even a bycast. It almost seems comic. I mean, it almost, you know, the sparrow wars, it almost seems like ridiculous. Uh, and, uh, and it's, it's not, in the end, it's not ridiculous at all. As a matter of fact, it's, yeah. it's a horrible tragedy. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's, it's such a bizarre idea so like how could we convince the whole population this was a good idea well apparently you can you can and it's i mean it's i think it is important without commenting on any any particular you know current political thing that it's it, this is a this is a human story and the human society has always had issues where people can come in and it's it's just one of those things that you you look at this and you hope that we don't end up in a place like it again uh, mm -hmm. and that you're not necessarily safe from it but it's it is an interesting for this particular you know for this particular kind of instance we're looking at i mean they did have a lot to do with what was what was going on in china at the time that was uh, mm -hmm. integrally collected connected to it i did wonder you know ultimately as you mentioned this this ended up having really far worse consequences than even some other major wars i mean more people may have died in you know, this famine then died in China during yeah. World War II, which was, again, there were huge, horrible things going on in China yeah, in World it's, War it's II. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And the sparrows were not the only reason for the famine. Yeah. But, I mean, it was I mean, it was an unbelievable horror, larger than many wars. Yeah, and and uh, we, we just almost can't conceive of that many people dying of starvation. Did the did the Chinese downplay the famine to the rest of the world? Uh, there is certainly at least an argument among many historians that the numbers that were provided by China were well under what really happened. Uh, and, but I mean, any time you have uh, disasters of that level, there's you know there there's going to be a variety in the estimates. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say, without trying to get into politics, that you can't necessarily always believe. What, this is the same regime that told you to kill the sparrows, right? So that you can't always believe that everything that comes out of that regime is going to be truth, because uh, that you know you're you literally as a culture where people are you know will conform truth to ideology. So. Uh, uh, you know, beyond, I, I can say that there are people who are experts in the field who think that the numbers are mar much larger than what was reported at the time and what has been reported since. And even those numbers as they were reported, I mean, were a tragedy uh, of just immense, yeah, immense. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah, it's frightening. But I mean, you're right that, that ultimately there's all, all kinds of places where we, we only have estimates and there are a variety of reasons for that. But it's especially when, you know, it's you can blame the regime for doing it. The regime does not necessarily want to put the worst spin on that. I think that's a pretty natural. Uh, uh, very, very few places are out there to say, "Oh yes, we're bad, and we're so bad." Look, <laughs> and they, that's not usually what they want to do. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so, what have you been watching on Magellan TV?
I watch lots of things, but uh, just today, actually, I picked up, I was watching one on archaeology about the uh, Edved girl, who's, uh, it's in, it's a grave that was discovered in Norway, uh, and it's really intriguing. It's oak coffin, which were very rare, and they were very expensive, and yet it was a fairly young girl who appeared not to have been from the area, and it's, it's an archaeological mystery about why she was there and who she was. I don't want to spoil that, but I can say that it's really fun to me. Archaeology is really fun to me when it becomes something of a of a you know of a mystery show of a Columbo show, uh, trying to figure out from the clues that are just left behind. And uh, so it's uh, what I can say. It, it's hard for me to say anything about it without spoiling you know the sort of stuff that they found. And the Ed, 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 Ed girl is, is apparently felt fairly well known. Like in Norway, people know about this grave find. I don't think it's pretty well known here, uh, but it ends up being you know as twists and turns the whole way as we find out more th and in different things about this girl and who she was, why she came to be buried the way that she was. So I, one of the things I love about Magellan is that there's uh, so many different kinds of videos and so many different kinds of things. And, and uh, this, this study of ancient history is it's fascinating how you uncover you know, what you can from the limited clues that are left behind. And this is a great example of that. I absolutely would recommend it. It's definitely worth your time. What have you been watching on Magellan TV? Similar vein. I was also watching an archaeology one. I, I open this playlist and it, the playlists are kind of cool that Magellan does. They'll kind of collect thematically some stuff or like they've got a best of 2021. Uh, so I was looking at the grandeur of Rome playlist. And what I saw in there was uh, one of, that was about them digging up the port of Theodosius. Theodosius I was the last Roman emperor who ruled both the Eastern and Western Roman empires. Essentially what has happened now is that the, the ports that he had built have become co totally full of silt and buried. And so now in, two, well, in like 2004, they are building, they were building this, I think it's probably functional now, I guess I'm not sure, uh, but it, a, a giant railway system under the, uh, the Bosporus so that they could connect essentially Asia and Europe. Um, so they were trying to do this. And of course, this is a, this is a part of the world where uh, you literally can't kick a rock without un uncovering something ancient. Mm -hmm. And so they we're hoping to have had this open by 2010 and it everything was being delayed because every time they went to dig something they're finding ancient byzantine or even more ancient stuff and so they're going in there and finding all of this stuff but one of the cool things that they find is this port and at this port they find like 37 uh, Byzantine ships and some some ships that we had never we had never found examples of before. A lot of what the the drama of this documentary is about is how they are dealing with the fact that they're trying to build this railway. And so literally while they are building this stuff, the archaeologists are digging up the the wood. And so it, the faster you can get this stuff out, the better. And it, it's a, it's an interesting way to talk about you know this kind of archaeology and. Uh, getting this kind of archaeology, what we can learn from it, just like with the with the girls that, you know, we're finding all this incredible stuff and we can really, it's amazing what kinds of history we can tell. And of course, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash history guy, where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash history guy. Next, the history guy talks about a war between Mexico and France that all started because of pastries. Even with all the odd events that we see in history, it's still hard to imagine two nations going to war over pastry. In the late 1830s, a Frenchman living in Mexico, known only as Remontel, sent a note to the French government and Emperor Louis-Philippe complaining that his pastry shop on the outskirts of Mexico City had been looted and that the Mexican government was refusing to pay damages. Little could this Remontel have known that he was throwing a spark that would become the fires of war, or that this short pastry war would have ramifications for Mexico for decades to come. It's history that deserves to be remembered. Ever since Mexico achieved independence from Spain with the Treaty of Cordoba in 1821, the country had been plagued with violence and instability. Between 1824 and 1837, the country had more than 30 heads of state, variously elected presidents, appointed replacements, or leaders of coups. Because of the instability, there was almost no policing in the country, and the violence spilled over into businesses and private property. The first president elected after independence was Guadalupe Victoria, a leader in the War for Independence, who served from 1824 to 1829. His term was an anomaly. No other president would manage to finish his term for the next nearly 30 years. 
In the election of Victoria's successor in 1828, Secretary of War Manuel Gomez Pedraza won the election and was supported by Victoria. Under the Mexican Constitution of the time, the president was elected by state legislatures and not by popular vote. General Santa Ana, later of the Alamo fame, rebelled in support of the second place Vicente Guerrero, a more radical general of the revolution whom supporters argued had more popular support. Called the Mutiny of La Acordada, Guerrero supporters took over the Acordada, a prison turned armory in Mexico City, in November of 1828. Days of fighting racked the city, and Pedraza fled to England in exile, abetting his claim to the presidency. Congress later appointed Guerrero to the seat that Pedraza had resigned, but for several months before he took office, anarchy reigned. On December 4th, a victorious crowd 5,000 strong rioted and converged on the Perrien building in Mexico City Central Square, which held a number of luxurious shops and was a core of trade. One Mexican governor described what was called the Perrien Riot. Numerous insolent plebes forced open the doors of the Perrien and then began sacking the building, or bazaar, which for more than a century was the emporium of commerce and contained cash goods worth the enormous sum of two and a half million pesos. The Perrien Riot was simply one of the more egregious examples of the almost endemic violence in Mexico at the time, and when the foreign shop owners appealed to the Mexican government, they found that the complaints fell on deaf ears, a government that was either unable or unwilling to do anything for them. When, in 1838, the French government received Remental's complaint detailing the looting of his pastry shop, it was just the last in a long and growing list of complaints from French nationals who were suffering in the unstable nation. The shop, supposedly valued at about a thousand pesos, demanded the huge sum of 60,000 pesos in compensation. These were not the only sources of dispute between the two countries. A French national had been executed in 1837 for piracy. <laughs> Don't all good stories involve pirates? And Mexico's trade with France was subject to higher taxes than trade with the U.S. and Great Britain. Possibly most importantly, France was angry over unpaid debts that Mexico had occurred during the Texas Revolution in 1835 and 36. But while this complaint over pastries was probably not the largest excuse for French intervention, it was reported widely in the French papers as the Cassis Belly for the war, and thus gave the conflict its famous name. The French government officially demanded 600,000 pesos in compensation for various claims, the equivalent of 3 million francs. It was at the time an enormous sum of money. In 1837, a small French squadron, a frigate, and three brigs was sent to convince Mexico of their resolve. They anchored off Veracruz and blockaded the port essentially unopposed, capturing 36 merchantmen. By April 1838, diplomatic relations had completely broken down. The Mexican Congress refused to pay the sum, so France sent a new force to begin a blockade of important Mexican ports in the Gulf, from the Yucatan to the Rio Grande. The small force at Veracruz had been struck with yellow fever, so no attack on the city came until the fall of that year. The second fleet, under Admiral Charles Baudin, included four large frigates, two 24-gun corvettes, eight brigs, and two bomb ships. But then tried to negotiate with Mexico, now led by Anastasio Bustamante, but the Mexicans refused to budge. The blockade, while effective, was not debilitating, and Mexico hoped to hold out until the French had to resupply, as they were using the Spanish port of Havana as their base of operations. Finally, Baudin issued an ultimatum that he would attack the city's fort at noon on February 27th. As the French ships moved to battle order, the city sent two men out to negotiate, while a number of neutral ships anchored out of range to watch the impended battle. At 2 p.m. on November 27th, Bonin sent a message to the city. I have lost all hopes to obtain through pacific means the honorable settlement that I was in charge of proposing to the Mexican cabinet. I find myself in the necessity to open hostilities. A half hour later, the French fleet began their bombardment. The fortress was large and imposing, but armed with only 186 old and poorly maintained guns and a garrison of 800 poorly equipped and ill soldiers. The French attack was devastating. But Dan would later describe the battle, saying that never before had I seen a more nourished and well-directed fire. I had no other worry than to moderate its ardor. From time to time, I signaled a ceasefire to let the smoke that hit the fortress dissipate. We then corrected the pointing in fire, and would begin again with a renewed vivacity. The defenders of the fort bravely returned fire, but they were unable to do much damage to the attacking fleet. Two of the fort's powder magazines exploded, and shortly thereafter the fort's signal tower collapsed in an impressive mushroom cloud of debris. After a fourth explosion around 5 p.m., the return fire from the fort diminished significantly. At 8 p.m., Baudin called for a cease fire, simply so that his own ships could conserve ammunition. Baudin and the Mexicans negotiated throughout the night. Baudin offered the fort honorable capitulation, but if they refused, he said it would annihilate the fortress. 
The fort was in fact in dire straits. The upper battery was completely destroyed. 200 men had already been killed or injured and much of the fort's ammunition had been destroyed. The Mexican general finally surrendered when Baden threatened to bombard the city. The powerful fort had been bombarded to submission in a single afternoon by a relatively light squadron of ships. The victory actually stunned foreign observers, including men aboard the U.S. revenue cutter Woodbury at port after an accidental collision with a French ship. The French casualties were only four dead and 29 wounded. Three artillery companies and French infantry occupied the fort, but allowed around a thousand Mexican soldiers to remain inside the city. Mexican authorities were shocked by the capture of the fort, which they thought to be almost invincible. They declared war on France and sent 3,200 soldiers under General Santa Ana and General Mario Arista. Santa Ana had been near Veracruz at the time of the attack, where he had been living in retirement on a ranch. His reputation had been ruined by his failure during the war with Texas, but he offered his services again to the government upon sighting the city, and they accepted. The army arrived in Veracruz quickly, frustrating Bodin, who had thought the attack would lead to renewed negotiations. Veracruz was defended by a ring of fortifications along with the Mexican army, but the French knew the small city well. He planned a raid on the city with the goal of surprising the army and capturing Santa Ana. In the early morning of December 5th, around 1,500 Frenchmen landed, the infantry reinforced with sailors from the ships. Two columns climbed the city wall and took the Mexican defenders completely by surprise, capturing them without a shot fired. The soldiers hurried to follow the walls to the city's far side. A third column attacked the door to the port and was tasked with assaulting the buildings where the generals were staying. They blew the door and reached the building almost unstopped, but Mexican defenders began putting up resistance. The French captured General Arista, but Santa Ana was able to escape. Baudin, who disembarked, ordered his men back aboard the boats. The first two columns retreated successfully, but while the third was being loaded, Santa Ana commanded a counterattack. The French used carronades on the boats and captured artillery to repel the attack. The Mexican force was badly bloodied in the attack, and Santa Ana's horse was killed and his leg badly wounded, and have to be amputated shortly thereafter. Eight Frenchmen were killed and 56 wounded, many of them by friendly fire in the chaos of the counterattack, while Santa Ana says he lost 31 killed and another 26 wounded. The attack did finally convince the Mexican government to return to the negotiations. The British offered their services as mediators, and Ambassador Robert Pagnam was dispatched to assist. The French did not change their demands as their position grew stronger, and ultimately Mexican promised to pay the 600,000 pesos, as well as a promise of trade commitments in place of indemnities for the war. The treaty was signed on March 9, 1839, and the French forces withdrew. Thus, the short pastry war, lasting only three months, came to an end. While the Pastry War was brief, it had a surprisingly large impact on Mexican history. One of the things it did was rehabilitate the reputation of the infamous general Antonio Lopez de Santana, who then again seized the presidency in March of 1839. His dictatorial and incompetent rule, along with the sorry state of the Mexican economy, led to more instability, revolution, and violence. The impact on the Mexican economy and military was disproportionately large for such a brief conflict. That left Mexico in a much reduced position just 10 years before they would again be at war, this time with the United States. The Mexican loss in that conflict had a profound impact on the future of both nations and the relationship between the two. But the brief pastry war set a precedent for more French intervention in Mexico. The 600,000 pesos was never paid and that became a significant part of the complaints that eventually led to the much more devastating five and a half year long second French intervention in Mexico which had the French briefly installing an Austro-Hungarian duke as emperor of Mexico. While there were many causes of the instability in the Mexican Republic following independence from Spain, it was in many ways the pastry war that facilitated nearly a century of instability and foreign intervention that really didn't subside until the end of the Mexican Revolution in 1920. All because of a complaint over some stolen pastries. The Mexican history is very interesting and quite convoluted, but I think it's absolutely shocking to look at this event, this pastry war, which sounds absolutely silly, and see how much actually, how many consequences and how long these consequences lasted. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Raymond Tell, when he gave this, uh, set, you know, sent this request to the French government, do you think he had any idea what he was about oh, to set no, off? I doubt it. I doubt it. I mean, he was, you know, he was just, a, uh, he was a merchant who was wrong, felt he was wrong, and he was looking for someone to compensate him for his loss. So, no, I don't think he probably thought the France was going to come invade. Uh, but, uh, you know, he had to have some understanding of the political situation. 
uh, that was going on, and and probably some of the you know the uh, the attitudes towards foreigners and and the foreigners' attitudes towards the Mexicans, and uh, so I'm sure that he had some clue of the context of things, but I, I sincerely doubt that he thought that it was going to wind up being what it was. Well, and ultimately, while you know we call this the pastry war, and we look at his actions specifically, his were the culmination of quite a lot of complaints. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the war of the bucket wasn't over a bucket. The pig war wasn't over a pig. The war of yeah. Jenkins ear was not over Jenkins ear. Those were all just, you know, events that were tied to, you know, broader things that were going on. Uh, and, you know, how much did Raymond Tell know that these were broader things that were going on or that this yeah. could spark those? You know, I don't know. But I mean, he might have shared some of those frustrations and angers that would, you know, eventually lead to what it was. Yeah. He might have been quite supportive of, say, what the French did. It's hard to know. He pretty much disappears from the historical record. But yeah. uh, he might have been quite supportive of the invasion, even though ultimately it didn't get him or anybody else anything. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> that that might have been for him. You know, he, he sends that in and then the French invade. And he's like, well, finally, they're doing something. That really might yeah, have been I mean, his you know, the, response. The history of, of France invading in Mexico is interesting, and, and uh, the, uh, the the whole history of European in, engagement in Mexico is interesting. But is, so is the, the, the long-term conflict between Mexican conservatives and Mexican Republicans. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's how you get Santa Ana coming back multiple times. And, and it was just, it was, a, and, and it all kind of stacks on each other because each yeah. one adds debt. Uh, each one adds, you know, death. Uh, each one, you know, makes it more difficult to recover. And then, the, you know, the, the issues that are left over then keep re-rising. And the, really, I mean, for a century, Mexico was at war, could not keep stable governance. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so and it was only being propped up by European debt, which then couldn't be paid, which would lead to more European involvement. And you know, it was it was a crazy time. It really was. And, and, and uh, still now we affects... can go back and see, you know, we're like, oh, well, there are 30 years where they didn't have a... Uh, anyone able to finish their term and there's something comical about that but the the truth is i mean life for the average person in mexico at the time had to just be absolute chaos oh it could be it could be and and it could be very deadly and you, know, yeah. you never know who side you on and that you know that it went at least through the period of the mexican revolution up into yeah. the into the 20th century and so that had to be you had to be terrifying and it also meant that you could you know you couldn't build wealth and you couldn't you know move family forward and so uh, i mean it's uh, when you look at it it's not, it's not, as crazy as it sounds that you know the fight was over pastry it was stolen pastry or whatever I mean, it really was, you know, people's lives were involved, people were killed. And in the end, you know, it was all over a fight where in the end, you know, Mexico wasn't able to pay anyway. Even if you came down there and say, oh, you're going to, you know, I'm going to break your legs, you don't pay. I mean, there's there's no money to pay. So, I mean, it's it in many ways, it's tragic. And, uh, the, you know, the, the long term, I mean, who would have guessed that that would bring Santa Ana back to power? Uh, I mean, I mean, who would, who would have thought it was going to lead to that? Uh, but I mean, it does. And, and then that has its own consequences, too. And so it's it's. Uh, what you can say is it's certainly history that deserves to be remembered, uh, but it's kind of hard to understand what, you know, how either side fell into the conflict over this. Yeah. And, and, and it had to do with things, and some of it even went beyond the politics of Mexico and had to do with the politics of the French Empire. And, and uh, it, that's, it's bizarre. I mean, the, the, the reason that you, that you look at the Patriot Wars, Patriot Wars, how could this lead to a war? I mean, how could this actually be the thing that led to a war? But it, it, somehow it did. Somehow this event you know, tied to the other events and precipitated something I, I don't think anybody really wanted. Well, and specifically, ultimately, the pastry ends up being the spark. And so there was a whole lot of tinder before that, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you know, there, there had to be. And, you know, and, and what was the Mexican official thinking when he was in a foreign shop? Did he, you know, did he not think about what the, the consequences might be? Or was he looking for that to precipitate something because, yeah, because there was resentment towards uh, Europeans? And and so I mean every everybody involved I I, I don't imagine we're thinking oh you know it's going to wind up here is that France is going to invade Mexico over these pastries but uh, but I mean that's uh, they also had to have some idea of you know how crazy the situation was yeah that there was always that, and well I mean for, truly the foreign countries were threatening uh, they. Try to get uh, someone to pay. Yeah, for your, and your... competing <laughs> over who? I mean, there were there were various European interests in Mexico. Some of that to offset what's going on in the United States as well. Uh, but, uh, and you know, there were still growing empires, uh, and uh, everybody yeah. was always afraid that someone else was going to step in and you know take control of the situation. And and that's what you know you had Spain, you had Mexico. I mean, there was also a German interest in Mexico. There was an American interest in Mexico, uh, and uh, you know this is just part of that broad tapestry. Of uh, and you know Mexico prior to Spain, Mexico was not a single unified people, and so you've also you know you've, you're you're tying together knots that had never been tied before too, uh, and uh, you know, with the people who were never able to do that outside of you know having that forced upon them by a, a European influence, I mean you know there's there's a whole lot that went into instability 
uh, as well as just basic yeah. fundamental questions about uh, power as an institution. And I mean, the questions that were being asked in the in the this unstable period in Mexican history were questions that were being asked throughout the world. Uh, they were just uh, Mexico was in a in a position where they could shake it more. Yeah, that's a really that's that's I think that's a really good way of of saying it. You know, a lot of the people in the comments of this video. Uh, make the joke that it, of course it was france that would start a war over pastries <laughs> they take that they take their their pastries very seriously oh. but from from a serious standpoint i think as we've we've talked about the war was about quite a lot more than that and yeah it was and it, if the whatever the shop was if they came in and destroyed the inventory then it would have been i mean the only connection there is that it's it's not a shocker that the person that was running a pastry shop was french i mean maybe he was more likely to be an expert in pastry but i mean if, they, if he was selling something else and they had come in and busted it up or taken it or taken his money or taxed him some way and he complained to the emperor it could, it could have led to the same thing but i mean it's one of the reasons you talk about the pastry war is just because that i mean the whole premise of it seems absurd. I mean, we say the same thing about the pig war and the war of the bucket and, and uh, the, uh, the That's why people talk war. about it. That's a little bit different. But I mean, yeah, you have these, the, the whole name of the war seems so ridiculous. Like, how did this lead to a war? And you find out it's, there's a whole lot more to it than, you know, than the precipitating event. And you almost have to think that it was named ironically at the time. I mean, and the people who named it the pastry right. war, you know, uh, which was, I, I, and for most of them, I honestly don't know. I'd have to go back and look again from the pastry war. But I mean, most of the time, that's something, a moniker that someone comes up later. At the time, they didn't call it the pastry war. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the people who were naming that, whether that's, you know, looking backwards or at the time, they have to be thinking ironically about that because you know it's not, the pastry war was not over pastry. But uh, it was over yeah. economic relations uh, and the treatment of foreign citizens uh, and the payment of foreign debt. Uh, and uh, the tensions between different peoples, uh, you know, who have and you the, know, involved in each other's affairs, government. Yeah, yeah, uh, and 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 it was also, I mean, it was also you know, over things like you know, money. And I mean, if Mexico had been more militarily prepared, then it would have been a lot less likely that France was going to invade over pastry. But True. Mexico was militarily at the time had you know lost so much that they were an easy target, and and that's that's what happened. That kind of that kind of ends up being spiral that Mexico sits in for pretty much the entire it does, 19th yeah, century. Yeah, because each every conflict leaves them uh, less able as a people to resist the next conflict, and that yeah. and that leads to you know more and more conflict, and and just a just a, a a terrible unstable time in the nation's history. Which does bring up the most famous dude in this uh, <laughs> in the whole story, Santa Anna, who Santa Anna, yeah, his. I mean, he's just a ridiculous dude. He's an out of sight. I mean, and a very serious guy too. I mean, he does lots of bad things and various. I mean, but has a, somehow has a, very, has a very mixed history in yeah. Mexico and in, in what Mexico thinks of Santa Ana. Yeah. But ultimately, he was a very somehow. He always seems to, or at least for a very long time, for years and years, seems to lose everything, and then somehow mm -hmm. get it back. Yep. And this, I mean, the fact that he's even involved in this, which of course he is, anything that was going on, Santa Ana was going to find a way to get involved. Yeah, in. well, I mean, he just kind of wandered in the street and took control of some soldiers there, and it somehow becomes hero of a war that they lost. And it's <laughs> it's interesting because the story, because he's, you know, this is where he loses his leg. And, and you know, there's this story that during the war with, the U.S. war with Mexico, that his leg was actually his prosthetic leg was captured by an Illinois infantry regiment. So one of his prosthetic legs is here in Illinois. Uh, actually, two of them are here in Illinois. Uh, and uh, uh, so, we, you know, we, we laugh about that story sometimes. But I mean, you know, this is where he lost his leg. He is such a fascinating historical character. He really is. But I mean, that was also representative of Mexico at the time because there were these, there's really these two yeah. competing elements between the conservative elements and the liberal elements. And yet there was, there was just not resources for anybody to run a government successfully. They owed so much debt and and uh, and the, the nation had been so ruined from all the wars and so they, they shift back and forth and so it's not surprising to see his you know his fortunes continue to turn uh, because there are only so many options out there and none of them are good options and so you know swings back and forth and back and forth but this is an interesting part his his return here and when it goes yeah. south they dig his leg up and came <laughs> come carry it back to him <laughs> i mean again it's it almost seems comic it's like you know you couldn't you couldn't write this stuff for a movie people wouldn't believe it uh but it also is it's uh, the fact that you'd have a war over pastry or that that would put Santana back in charge and that he would bury his own half his leg with with military honors and then they would dig it up honors, and all that sort yeah. of stuff that that's uh, you know it's kind of representative of the dumpster fire that that Mexico was for nearly a century where where every oh, yeah. every event then left you in a in a in a poor position to resist the next event and leads to instability over 100 years which had true human consequences
and I, I, I think still impact, I st they still impact Mexico yeah. today. I mean, you know, it, it, well into the 21st century even. Now. But at least, you know, at least it's turned into a stable government. When it's not the yeah, the Mexican that's true. It's, anymore, it's not. But, uh, but man, Santa Ana, he just he rolled with the punches. And even uh -huh. though he apparently was unable to ever just maintain his popularity because of his own foibles, um, he truly was always looking for his opportunity. And I, was, I think yeah. that that's and he was thinking of himself. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I, I honestly think no matter no matter what he said about, you know, country or Mexico, I he was looking out for himself, and that's a lot of why he kept coming up and then going yeah, down. I think that might be true of a lot of people in power. Uh, and, and there's interesting histories of Santa Ana and what his motivations might be. But I mean, yeah. certainly the selfishness there. I mean, maybe to the point of something like a malignant narcissist or something like that. I mean, I'm, it's difficult I'm sure that there's some people that historically could, could diagnose him <laughs> with something. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I mean, uh, he also seems to have been a, a patriot who really did true. care about his country and was willing to fight, you know, the French for his country. And I, I don't know. He's just... He He's, he's a fascinating historical figure who deserves to be remembered but uh, it's hard to take it's hard to take a side on the opinion of Santa yeah. Ana and and that's that's very much how as if I understand it correctly that's how Mexico sees it I mean how do you see someone as both a hero and a villain at the same time I mean, you kind of do uh, he, and there he, hasn't he been turns. hasn't been a big move to get his leg back from Illinois because they there were several left behind in Mexico I mean like we got several in the museum you know we don't really much care so the, the fight is between Illinois and Texas over <laughs> Santa Ana's leg but Mexico doesn't seem to really need that particular leg uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it just shows you know what his legacy is though maybe his biggest legacy uh, in the end was bringing chewing gum to uh, to the United States that was, <laughs> he, that was uh, Santa Ana he reminds me a little bit of uh, to go way back in history of Alcibiades during the uh, the Peloponnesian. Oh yeah, War, yeah. Cont where... Continually sleeping, always popping up in power. Continually changing sides, goes down, <laughs> pops back up. It's and yeah. it's it's difficult. I mean, with both of them, you're right. It's difficult to really know what. I mean, Alcibiades, of course. There's some person. There's some amount with both of them. There's some amount of personal selfishness. They want their own power, but it's difficult to know 100. percent I mean what their actual feelings were and if they were patriotic and I, they end up serving different sides for different reasons and they <laughs> they live yeah, a ridiculous they live what ends up being just an absolutely ridiculous life and what's crazy is that just like both of them no matter how much happens they're just somehow always able to stay relevant <laughs> yeah yeah and kind of, i mean they're always you know always waiting on the fringes for the whoever replaced them to falter so that they can yeah. pop back into power and who knows this i mean is that this human nature that once you've had power you just don't want to lose you know, you always want to get it back or or uh, was it unique to their personalities or were they literally so big personalities so, so their impacts in history so overly large that we really can't understand them as humans uh, but i mean however you put it together the extraordinary career of of antonio de santana uh, is that uh, uh, the, that the pastry war brought him back into power another time, uh, and th and then after he was done in power, then that he would come back again. I mean, yeah. it's just it's just absolutely this is this is an, uh, one of the reasons that this this strange conflict at the time uh, is is interesting is because it, it it is another spot in the career of this person who just you know looms so large in Mexican history of the period that they call it the, the you know the, the, the Santa Ana period, and, and it's. Uh, you know, it's, it, it all around is another reason why the, the pastry war deserves to be remembered. I mean, if you if you go back and look at newspapers at any time, you're going to find out there's always something going on that we've probably forgotten today. I mean, you know, 100 oh, yeah. years ago, something was making the headlines that we didn't that we've forgotten today. And but but when you go back and look at those, you really understand what they mean from the time, and then you you see why the you know the history guy believes that history deserves to be remembered. There's always something interesting, and these are you know we talk about we try to talk about the the more forgotten stuff, but man, there's always something that is less is, well yeah. known and even the stuff that you remember there's things that we've forgotten about it so i mean there's there's just tons yeah. and tons of plenty of history out there uh, but it's it's hard to understand the whole context of the history of mexico in the 19th century without yeah. the context of the pastry war even though it's it's relatively small compared to you know the you know the the maximilian affair or the the, the mexican revolution uh it, it is it is it was a turning point that changed you know the direction of where things were going to go but it certainly represented yeah. many of the issues that fa mexico faced over that whole period especially the the period of foreign involvement and foreign yeah. debt and the hope that someone could take control of mexico in order to be a counter to the united states and those those would continue to to come back and, and you know cripple that nation time and time again and it's it truly is i mean it's there's a tragedy to the fact that the pastry war for all of the things that it did mean and didn't mean uh, 
Mexico was never going to be able to pay that back because of yeah. because of the continuing instability. Uh, their promises meant nothing. And the thing is, they might have had the best intentions, but there was just no way they were going to get that money. And it, it, this this essentially does ultimately lead to uh, France's decision to come in. And they have all lots of reasons for mm -hmm. doing that, for trying for invading Mexico and supporting uh, Maximilian. Um, but one of the I mean, one of the reasons was that there clearly was no way that France was going to get paid. Uh, for for any of those things, unless they essentially came in and and took the place, and Mexico was was not going to be, and maybe eventually. But the thing is, there were just I mean, constant. You know, Mexico just kept. Could could Maximilian have you know? Could the the younger brother, the Archduke of of Austria Hungary, really have fixed things? It's you know, it's, it's an interesting right? question. But yeah, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, it. Uh, but I mean, uh, this national debt has driven lots of conflict, yeah. uh, and. Uh, and it, it it just felt like it felt like you know Mexico got hit with a punch and never were quite able to get back on their feet again before someone else was punched them again and and this is yeah. this is an example of that and uh, it leads to you know the sort of counterfactuals to say you know what what if you know uh, what if Mexico had had more time you know, the Republican movement and the, and the, the, what if they had had more time to you know to actually get their legs under them and see what Mexico would become uh, how different would Mexico be today as a modern yeah. state it's kind of hard to say. It's an interesting. But, question. I mean, this this is this is this is part of a tapestry of events that went over the the horse, and, and you know affects uh, Mexican American history too because we're on the border and and Mexican European history, and you know it's just it's all around. Uh, uh, you, you, I mean, it, you pull this one out, and you get a you know you get a whole different string of events that come afterwards. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.